During the evening brush hour on Friday, November 1st, 1918, scores of men and women left work and headed home for the weekend. As they did every day, hundreds of New Yorkers paid their five cent toll and boarded the wooden train cars that serviced the Brighton Beach Line in the New York City subway system. The weary commuters, exhausted from the work week, as well as the looming Spanish flu pandemic, which had just seen its deadliest month in October of 1918, no doubt looked forward to the weekend's reprieve. Sadly, about one in six of those passengers would not make it home to their families. Earlier that morning, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers, which was a labor union that represented many of the subway train operators for the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company, went on strike they were protesting the firing of 29 subway train operators, also known as motormen, due to their union organization activities. As a consequence of this strike, there was a severe shortage of motormen, meaning there were not enough qualified people to operate the subway trains. As a temporary fix to this problem, the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company employed scab workers with minimal experience and training to operate the trains in the absence of the motormen. This is exactly how Antonio Edward Luciano found himself at the helm of one of the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company's elevated trains servicing the BMT Brighton line. Luciano, better known to his peers as Anthony Lewis, was a crew dispatcher who was given just two hours of instruction on how to operate one of the trains. At the time, it was typical for a motorman to receive at least 90 hours of training before being allowed to operate. Despite the lack of training, Lewis saw this as a good professional opportunity for him and took it. Lewis had actually already completed a full shift that day on the Culver line with no issue. However, the Brighton Beach line was a much more difficult line, one which even the most experienced motorman had troubles with. Lewis was tired from the long day at work. In addition to his first trip, he had successfully brought the elevated train through its first run from Manhattan over the Brooklyn Bridge to Brooklyn. It was during the return trip that things went tragically wrong. The first error occurred when the signal operators accidentally sent the train down the wrong course, forcing Lewis to have to back up the train to go over the correct track. After correcting the error, Lewis and his 650 passengers headed toward the Malbone Tunnel in the Flatbush neighborhood of Brooklyn. Survivors of the events noted that, once back on course, the train began speeding furiously. Some even stated that they felt they must have been going 70 miles per hour. It has been considered that Lewis was hurrying in order to make up for lost time due to being sent down that wrong track. Perhaps for the same reason, Lewis bypassed a stop at Consumer Park Station. In reality, as they approached the tricky S-curve at the bottom of a 70-foot incline going into the Malbone Tunnel, they were actually only traveling at around 30 miles per hour. Nonetheless, postings around the sharp curve implored motormen to take it at no more than 6 miles per hour. At 6.42 p.m., the train started rounding the sharp S-curve. Traversing the curve at five times the safe speed limit, the wheels of the first train car hung precariously to the tracks until the train entered the Malbone Tunnel. At that moment, the first car dislodged from the tracks. The second and third cars were hurled violently into the walls. As described by a reporter of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, the crash made matchwood of their sides and roofs, and that made indescribable fragments of scores of human beings. As the wooden walls, floors, and ceilings crumbled around the passengers of the second and third cars, the impact made deadly blades of the shattered glass, splintered woods, and twisted metal in the wreckage that tore through and impaled the helpless passengers. Even before the derailment, the speed of the train frightened the passengers. One passenger, a lawyer by the name of Charles Darling, dove to the ground and took cover out of fear. Many of the passengers died immediately. 
many others died of electrocution from the third rail. Even though the third rail was automatically turned off because of the train's derailment, remote operators assumed the power outage to the rail was a mistake resulting from the labor shortage and switched it back on. As the train came to a halt, the wreckage was cloaked in darkness. It was night and the lights were out in the tunnel. It took rescuers a harrowing 45 minutes to get to the scene and gain access to the tracks. Firefighters had to descend down to the tracks using ladders and dig their way through rubble to access the passengers. By this time, crowds had started gathering. Some curious about the site of the disaster, others worried their loved ones were aboard the wreckage. Either way, the crowds hindered rescue efforts as rescuers pulled bodies of the victims and survivors from the wreck. Reserves from six police precincts were deployed to manage the crowds and keep them from further blocking the rescue efforts and to allow passage for ambulances to access the scene. Volunteers from the Women's Motor Corps valiantly assisted in the rescue efforts by transporting the wounded to the hospitals and the deceased to the morgue. Furthermore, as poignantly written in the New York Times on November 2nd, 1918, some of the desperately injured breathed their last in the arms of these women. There is not an official death toll, but the estimated number of deaths in the Malbone Street wreck is between 93 and 102, with an additional 250 passengers injured. Most of the deaths in the accident were attributed to skull fracture. The victims of the disaster were taken to nearby Kings County Hospital, but it was over capacity with sufferers of the Spanish flu. Forced to act quickly, a makeshift infirmary was set up at nearby Ebbets Field, home of the Major League Baseball team, the Brooklyn Dodgers. Just after the accident, Charles Darling, the lawyer who braced for death on the floor of the train car, confronted temporary replacement motorman Anthony Lewis. He asked what had happened. Lewis replied, I don't know. I lost control of the damn thing. That's all. This was the last time Lewis was seen until he was arrested at home later that evening. He said he did not intend to run away after the wreck and said he remembered nothing until after he was already home. He had no recollection of how he escaped the wreck, nor how he got back to his home. According to the 1918 New York Times article, Lewis was seated in a chair, pale as death. When the detectives reached his home, he was very nervous and seemed to be on the verge of a collapse. It seemed Lewis had blocked what had happened from his memory, which is not uncommon with such devastating traumas. Moreover, it's possible that his mental status was already somewhat compromised going into his first shift as a motorman. Lewis was still recovering from a bout of the Spanish flu himself, and just three days earlier, he buried his three-year-old daughter who passed away from the flu. The combination of inexperience, bereavement of his young child, and the fact that he was unaware of the newly configured S-curve going into the Malbone Tunnel, Lewis was woefully unprepared to take the task of navigating the treacherous Brighton Line. Still, he, along with five other Brooklyn Rapid Transit supervisors and executives, were indicted on charges of manslaughter. It was determined that there were multiple causes of the accident. The inexperience of the novice motorman was an obvious cause, other causes were the recent changes to the route due to construction, which created the precarious S-curve. The train's excessive speed entering the Malbone Tunnel and the coupling of the train cars. It was not just the motormen who were on strike. The switchmen were as well. These were the individuals responsible for coupling the train cars together. This task is not done at random. There are important principles one must follow to do it correctly. The trains should be coupled with a motor car first, which is the heavyweight car with motors below it, followed by a lighter trailer car, continuing in the pattern of motor car, trailer car, and so forth. The inexperienced substitutes were either unaware of this practice or simply ignored it. The five cars that made up the train involved in the Malbone Street wreck was situated motor car, trailer car, trailer car, motor car, motor car. This problem magnified the damage caused by the wreck. 
It's why the second and third cars were so violently thrown from the track. Furthermore, the heavier fourth and fifth cars slammed into the derailed cars, killing would-be survivors in the process. None of the six people indicted on manslaughter charges were convicted. It's largely believed that the handling of the case was botched. The prosecution did not focus on the proper aspects of the case, rather than dealing with the negligence by the company resulting from their mishandling of the strike. They were swayed by the defense's position that the derailment was caused by mechanical errors, a notion that was proven wrong even by Brooklyn Rapid Transit's own investigation. Even more striking is the fact that theirs was the only investigation that took place after the wreck. As stated by Mark Aldrich in his book Death Road the Rails, American Railroad Accidents and Safety, 1828 to 1965, there never was a really independent investigation there were a couple of court hearings, a grand jury panel, but you don't see what you would see today. The National Transportation Safety Board would arrive on scene and they would pick it apart. As a result of this horrible disaster, the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company went out of business. The company's successor, the Brooklyn Manhattan Transit Company, however, paid a total of $1.6 million in civil suit claims to the survivors and family of the victims in 1923 a settlement which would be worth over $27 million today in 2022. The Malbone Street wreck led to fundamental changes in the transit system's approach to safety, such as phasing out wooden train cars, better signal systems, mechanisms to prevent excessive speeds, and adding speedometers and headlights to the trains themselves. Only a month after the disaster, the Malbone Street thoroughfare had its name changed to Empire Boulevard, with the exception of a single dead-end section to honor the 19th century developer for whom it was named. Anthony Lewis changed his last name back to Luciano, became a home builder, and lived until 1985. Though the tunnel still exists, it is only used as a turnaround for trains and never with any passengers. And according to the New York Transit Museum, while the tragic events of that day have faded from public memory, Transit workers ensured that one powerful reminder would remain. The switch that restored power to the tracks at Malbone Street 100 years ago is still present at the nearby Prospect Park Electrical Substation. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Hit the bell icon to get notifications when I release a new video. If you're interested in supporting Motive Horror and gaining access to exclusive perks and merchandise, use the link in the description to become a patron of my Patreon. Until next time.